A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 105th edition of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. We at Notebook have been privileged to be the hosts of this very long running series of webinars aimed particularly at creating a community of educators who are now part of a new normal. About a year back, back in April 2020, when the lockdown had just started, we at Notebook said, let's start a series of webinars where we can have esteemed educators like yourself join on a common forum and discuss various aspects related to our school education system. We've discussed a myriad range of topics over these 100 plus episodes that we've had in a span of more than a year. We've discussed curricular topics, extracurricular topics. We've discussed sports and games. We've even discussed mental health. Today, however, we go back to a topic that all of you are perhaps remembering from your BA days, lesson planning. Every teacher knows the importance of lesson planning. A lesson plan tells you what you're going to teach that particular day. Over a period of time, a set of lesson plans also tells you how the entire academic year is going to go. Today, we are going to explore the purpose, the various methods and the thought processes that go into making an effective lesson plan. What you're seeing on the screen is perhaps how lesson plans used to be developed, pen and paper, a lot of charts. We are going to explore today that has this also become digital. Are there now digital methods that would simplify this process? Or is this still the most engaging way for a teacher to plan how the lesson is going to go throughout the academic year? The first speaker that we have today to discuss this is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education. Mr. Barrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000. He's also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist and we at Notebook are privileged to have him as our senior advisor. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Shabayu. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Perfectly. Yeah, very good evening to you, Achin, uh, Avishek, Meghna, Gagori, the whole lot of y'all out there in Notebook. And uh, also to our panelists, Dr. Kathuria, as well as our, uh, all our friends who have tuned in for this evening's webinar. Let me tell you, I think uh, after 44 years being a teacher, I much rather talk about lesson planning than actually plan the lesson. And so uh, I'm gonna break up my talk into a very simple uh, structure. I'm gonna talk about the who, um, when, what, why, and how. So let's start with the who plans. Actually, we all plan. All of us, we plan when we want to do something successfully. We plan our holidays, we plan our finances, we plan where we want to settle down, insurance schemes. And so therefore teachers too um, have to, uh, apart from the above mentioned, they need to plan so that they can run their classes effectively. Um, if we just close our eyes and reflect on a particular teacher from our school days who we most fondly remember, I'm sure that we will think of somebody who was well planned and organized because children are able to sense when a teacher is well planned and organized. Um, if I go back to my class teacher, uh, my Hindi teacher was my favorite because he was impeccably dressed. His scooter was in pristine condition and he always came to class knowing exactly what he was going to do. Uh, there was nothing like, oh, what were we doing last time? Uh, can any, anyone tell us what page we ended on last class? He never came into class giving us the idea that he was hamming it. So most likely, uh, you know, teachers, uh, you know, who don't come planned will have discipline issues. Uh, they don't know what to do in class. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, the class moves in a jerky fashion. Uh, he's not in control, the, he's lost the interest or she's lost the interest of the class. And so therefore, it's important to understand who plans. We all plan. 
if, it, if you're a businessman or architects or doctors, we still plan our day. Now, when do teachers plan? I think there are three different types of plans. One is the annual plan, which we sit and do as a department at the beginning of the academic year. When we break up the entire syllabus into the two terms, maybe the spring and autumn term. And here we break up the entire syllabus into how many units or topics we will cover each month. And uh, this is in order that every teacher of the, a certain class, because you have met, might have many sections in a class, each teacher covers the, covers the subject in a, in a uniform manner. Because when you come to setting tests and monthly tests, if one teacher has raced on and covered seven chapters and one teacher is stuck on chapter three, it's difficult to set a common test. And so therefore, I think the beginning of the term plan for the entire year is very important. It prevents one teacher from finishing the course well in advance while somebody is lagging behind. Um, the second type of plan is a plan that, you know, again, the department may sit and take cognizance of a monthly plan. Um, this is a little more detailed. It lets the teacher know what has been covered this month. And uh, it also helps the teacher to get his, the aids and the videos and the various ed tech devices that he needs to use. It's not possible to get a lot of the ed tech curated onto a plan the next day, because every teacher has about four to five classes a day. So I think every month, the monthly plan is where a teacher looks at what he's going to put on maybe in that month and collect his information, collect all his data. Okay, so uh, this teacher might have to go to the, res the resource room or the computer room, depending on what schools have and what they call them. And uh, again, it depends on the protocols and the rules of each school. And then there's the daily plan. This is the plan that the teacher takes into class, not physically, he might have the plan in his head or on a notebook or on the laptop. But this is the plan which is very, very detailed and each lesson is taught according to this plan. And a teacher knows how he will proceed through that lesson using that plan. Now, the daily per lesson plan is something a teacher might make on a weekend for the coming week ahead. He may be, it also may be something that he sits in the staff room a few hours before the lesson and starts thinking about it. Experienced teachers need not even write out a plan. They may even think about a plan, think about how they're going to teach that class. But whatever he does or she does, a teacher cannot walk into class with no plan. Um, now, an experienced teacher will find it easier to plan because he has planned many more lessons. Um, and I think I have often made lesson plans while traveling to my first school in Delhi in the bus. I use the one hour bus journey to note, note down and think about what I was going to do. So even if it's a mental plan, I think there needs to be a plan. Some schools, of course, have very, very strict rules. You have to hand your plan into the departmental head. They are checked. They're returned. There may be some questions asked on the plan, et cetera. It depends on the school. Now, what is a plan in my view? A plan is like a road map. It's a map forward. And it's the map of the entire course, with, which also includes remedial work and revision work, which has to be factored in. Because if you don't uh, plan in these things, you will finish just a week before the test or the final exams, and there's no time for revision and recall. So. Uh, we must understand that we should finish our teaching a good two or three weeks before the end of the academic year so that we can go through some of the difficult chapters and problems. Teachers sometimes find themselves, you know, way short of completing their syllabus and there's a couple of weeks left. Now that sets in the panic mode. Children know that there's a lot of work to be done. They look, they head for tutors and uh, then the parents start writing in. And the teacher is forced to race through the last few chapters, which is not fair. Now, um, once a plan is made, I think it should be cataloged or kept on a computer because one does not have to reinvent the wheel every time, every year. And these plans can be improved, added to, subtracted from, altered, adjusted, you know, 
and also when sometimes a teacher may be absent or take long leave and a substitute teacher comes into class. These plans are very important where the substitute teacher may use a plan and continue because it's in line with what the uh, actual teacher was going to do. Now, uh, <clears throat> once you have a plan in, in place, teaching is not only easier, it's more productive, more effective, and it's more fun to be in the class because the teacher can plan in spare time. The teacher can plan in activities. He can plan in fun activities. Now, why do we make a plan? A plan makes teaching fun, as I said. A teacher knows how fast to proceed, which questions to ask, who to ask the questions to, what concepts are to be covered, what are the applications of the knowledge, what, you know, where do we apply this knowledge. A plan gives a teacher confidence and a sense of timing for the lesson. He can also anticipate questions from the most smart students and therefore control the lesson. And believe me, as I said earlier, an unplanned teacher can be spotted a mile off. And as he comes into class, he's flustered, the class gets out of control, the teacher raises his voice, and we have a vicious circle of indiscipline and poor learning. A good plan leads to total involvement of the class. And also because the teacher has taken into consideration individual students, their learning styles. He anticipates problems and tricky issues, difficult questions. And therefore, the teacher can negotiate through these you know, ripples in, in this lesson. A good plan also leads to total involvement okay, of, of the class. When a lesson is planned, the class, as I said, was disciplined. It's easy to spot children who are not paying attention and who need special attention. Now, this brings me to the um, looking at my school days. As I said earlier, um, you know, you, you, uh, my, my Hindi teacher was, was excellently planned. And not only that, because he was planned, he was a role model to, the to, to me especially and to many boys. Uh, because a teacher cannot expect a student to be organized and have his homework ready if he himself is all over the place. So for me, he was a role model of efficiency and planning. And therefore, I was forced to do my homework on time and neatly too. <clears throat> and yet, I have seen teachers roll into class without the foggiest idea. And uh, that 40 minutes or 45 minutes becomes agony. And then what happens? the class degenerates into a gossip session or there are free schools given or the teacher takes the class to the computer lab and, uh, you know, and all this leads to bigger issues. Now, how is a plan done? I'm gonna take you through the basic steps of planning. The first and the most important thing about planning is the opening, the introduction. This is the link, this is the hook where the teacher grasps, grasps the attention of the class. If the opening, like the opening of a play, the opening of a musical piece, if the opening is great, the key gets the student's attention. Um, I know a teacher who came into class with three different fruits, an apple, an orange, and a banana. And he juggled this, these three fruits and he got the class attention because he was going to teach permutation and combination in maths. And he used this, this, these three fruits to attract the students, to link it up to something in the past, and then he proceeded with his lesson. So the first is, how are you going to introduce this lesson? And what are you going to do to attract the focus of the children? Very often it could be a cricket match or something topical or something in the news or some disaster. And that's where you link your lesson to something, you know, which the children are familiar with, you know, just in the part of their daily lives. The second is, how are you going to link this lesson to what went before? How are you going to link it to other subjects? Correlation. For example, when I taught fjords in Norway, I always taught history as well. Because why did Hitler invade Norway and not Sweden? Sweden had more iron ore and more minerals than Norway. It is because he needed the fjords for his submarines. Because the German coastline 
was a very pathetic poor coastline therefore the german navy was very weak it didn't have a great navy which is why germany did not have the colonies that the english the french the belgians as the spanish had and so therefore you can link history and geography you can link geography it maps you can link subject so therefore a good plan links subjects together so and also there's a thing called expected knowledge i can't teach fractions if a child doesn't know how to add so a good plan takes into account what other subjects are doing are being uh, taught and at what level the third is i think a teacher has to have a clear vision of the learning outcomes what is to be taught in this lesson what are the skills that must be developed um this can be shared with the class because every lesson calls for different skills different objectives it can be an application class a skills class an observation class recall appreciation linguistic skills communication sharing of learning research comprehension looking forward asking deeper questions a uh, critical thinking so what are the objectives that the teacher hopes to achieve or cover in the lesson very very is very important the fourth of course is the major body of the lesson this is where the the real substance of the lesson is taught maths if it's fractions or history if it's akbar this is where your visuals your ed tech um, modules like notebook can be clipped and be become a part of the lesson this is where the questions are asked the debate goes on uh, this is the main part where students acquire wisdom knowledge um, it could be a silent lesson it could be uh, the teacher sets some work but this is where the learning takes place and this you know should be 20 to 25 minutes of the entire class because children's span of attention is limited then of course what a plan must include is assessment for um, assessment for learning this is the quizzes and the little drawings and the blackboard work asking students to come up and mark something on a map or giving a handout fill in the blank short answer question this is a test which helps students to learn it's not a test that tells you how much the students know and this is where the quizzes and the fun and the games take place this is where planning is important because it's a part of the lesson it doesn't come by a chance it's planned the sixth part is some work that the teacher might set in the class i call this what is the what what is the work the students produce it could be some written work it could be some oral work it could be a group discussion you can ask the class to get up get into small groups and work on something a handout for example so <clears throat> this is the work that the teacher makes the students do in class this is the creation of their work paragraph writing do the following sums read line 70 to 95 act 1 scene 3 uh, this is where the teacher actually walks around while the children are working and he pays individual attention to the students this is where he can focus on the weak student and not on everyone equally then i think the last 2 to 3 minutes must be recap recapitulation i don't think you can leave a class and walk out as the bell rings you need to recap the lesson because recall and recap is very important to bring a closure to the lesson bring it to some you know nice end it tapers the lesson off it also shows the children did you plan your time then i think the lesson plan has to include some assignment could be oral work take a do some photography do a chart do some research do some reading it's very important to leave children with a little bit of work that is done at home because the research has shown that if a child doesn't have the same lesson over the next 72 hours there's a huge amount of learning that is lost our memories are short lived but if a student goes home that evening and does some homework the lesson tends to stick also uh, yeah so this is the assignment part of the work and when a lesson is planned i think it's important to use the acronym smart when you plan a lesson it should be smart where s stands for specific again 
what are your what are your specific objectives measurable can you measure this yes by a test is it achievable can this what i teach is it can the students absorb it can they learn it is it relevant of course it has to be a part of the larger syllabus so it has to be relevant and is it time bound can i do this in the 45 minutes or half an hour i have most schools of course have a certain rubric or a format uh, on which they plan some teachers have their own form of uh, planning each one is independent each one is different um, uh, <clears throat> but it is not the forms and styles that are important it is the have you covered all the important points of lesson planning now these days with a lot of teaching being done online and in the days to come when blended learning is going to be the call of the day a lot of planning would have to be online you have to plan an online lesson which means you might follow the parts that are the steps i've taken but the main body of the lesson will have to include some edtech some uh, inputs from you know uh, searching the net the web um, you will have to use edtech in your teaching from now onwards um, very important in lesson planning is to collaborate with the teachers with all the teachers of a certain class all the sections it's important if they sit together and plan one does the curating one does the looking for images one does does the searching on you know for the various websites um, one does the putting the powerpoint together whatever microsoft teams collaboration is the very is very important for lesson planning today and uh, more so now than any time else because it takes the load of a teacher and saves time too um a good plan not only saves time it makes sure the course is complete it takes into consideration individual talents makes learning individualized you can look at each child and think of children who have a kinesthetic knowledge or you know spiritual knowledge now if you are teaching a lesson on let's say the renaissance of the catholic church it's important to know in your class which are the teach students who be very interested in religion if you are doing an ecological lesson there are the students who are very very keen on nature and birds and animals those are the children who you need to call upon they will jump up in your class the teachers uh, so a teacher who knows his students will plan according to the students in his in his class also lesson plans incorporate games and fun give the teacher as i said more control over the class he is in control so discipline is minimum uh, minimal it also improves engagement between student and teacher because when you plan a lesson you know how how fast to go or how slow to go you plan in the joke you plan in some fun you plan in some leg pulling and therefore you connect with the class far better and so therefore i i leave you with these uh, you know the few things i have done as a teacher lesson plan i always found it is difficult to plan it's time consuming but once you plan the good lesson the class response and the fun you have is really worth the effort you've taken thank you very much for listening and shubhayu over to you thank you thank you so much sir i wish we had a lot of non teachers joining in today because the one thing that would definitely happen is they would develop a deep appreciation for the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes the tireless efforts that our esteemed educators put in to make every single class period come alive thank you sir thank you so much for that introduction to the topic our next speaker is ochin bhattacharya ochin is the founder and ceo at notebook a chartered accountant by training ochin was a director at deloitte prior to starting notebook he has worked in india and abroad in various senior capacities in ge pwc kpmg and deloitte he is a fellow of the icai and a member of cpi australia and cpi ireland he is also the recipient of the prestigious indian achievers award ochin is a avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics history literature and philosophy he is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly he is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies ochin over to you good evening everyone shubhaya am i audible 
yeah chin loud and clear i once again welcome all of you to today's session on a topic which is very important for educators across classrooms around the globe now as we all agree a good plan is like a road map it shows the final destination and usually the best way to get there now a teacher should be prepared not only to teach the students but also to make sure that they take some fruitful thought regarding the lesson at the end of the class the take away instead of you know taking a lesson by lesson approach i believe it's more about building understanding of a topic over time thus get a long term plan is very important also uh as birds also mentioned to pinpoint the skills that a students need to develop looking at assessments for a unit really helps because you know the way it has to work is looking at assessments and then working backwards in order to ensure that learning objectives are met now it can be useful to collect all the information class needs to know for a for a for a particular unit in a single document termed as a knowledge organizer now as you plan it's important to return to the document periodically and because that helps in prioritizing what to cover in individual lessons that are planned also i believe the more detailed your long term plans are the better you can take charge of learning over time now this way individual lessons need less planning and become one step in a much bigger journey you know you have a long term plan and we are very sure about the learning objectives that way it is much more easier to plan individual lessons and also you are able to judge what stage students are and cover the skills needed at each point of time in that particular unit of work also sharing your long term direction with students uh means that they know exactly where they are going especially in higher classes and also what happens is uh, you know it's far more in control now when you are discussing about tests i believe racing through content without giving students a chance to review and and looking at their results results in forgetting important information so i believe regular tests but then again when we discuss about tests it's important that there has to be there have to be low stress tests you know also low stakes involved uh, for instance like quizzes as a psychology researcher henry roger and his colleagues highlighted in their research and it's very interesting research with regard to how to improve performance they highlight that uh, by starting each lesson with, with with a short quiz on previous content you begin to strengthen students working memories and and which really helps them retain information over a period of time also it's, it's it's very important to simplify individual lessons there's a very interesting theory with regard to this called uh, cognitive load theory which was developed by a psychologist john sweller this cognitive load theory is an evaluation of how we should plan lessons to avoid overloading students now this also is very very important one of the important aims in developing students uh, memories is to avoid excessive cognitive burden now how do we do that like it's simple to say but how do we actually put that into practice i guess streamlining you know streamlining your teaching cutting out uh, unnecessary distractions it really goes a long way in helping students to hold on to information another uh, another gentleman who has worked significantly in this particular area is a professor and educational researcher from new zealand graham nathel and if, if i remember he pointed out something really interesting and very insightful he said that activities need careful designing activities need careful designing so that students cannot avoid interacting with relevant information now 
education very often feels like a balancing act between uh, on one hand we have uh, curriculum standards on the other hand we have student engagements while juggling learning standard extracurricular commitments and also the mountains i'll say the mountains of administrative tasks you know that accompany uh, you know an educator's job at times uh, it's very common that our teachers or esteemed educators ask themselves that how can i really engage with my students how can i really equip my students with critical thinking skills and and very important to me it's most important how can i avoid killing my students love of learning because it's really important to nurture the same now a uh, professionals in the education field and here considering the fact that we have so many esteemed educators now today in this forum and i speak so i'm sure all of you would agree with me that delivery of lesson delivery of a lesson is just as important as the lesson content equally important right it's a method that really determines how much is retained and how much is lost in translation now while governing bodies may prescribe a frame framework for for learning outcomes for educators to achieve uh, in in a given time frame this framework are predominantly content driven and operate as a list for educators to tick off as they proceed through the through the teaching year now the checklist is there to ensure that each student receives equal access to information with the goal of uh, with the goal of providing a level playing field however uh, educators are left to decide how best to deliver this information to the students uh, in their particular classrooms i remember uh, according to uh, peter burn the author of uh, the lesson planning handbook and uh, it's a very very uh, interesting handbook essential strategies that inspire student thinking and learning now he said that you know while these approaches include what we want to teach they don't often contain how we are going to teach it and that is most important how we are going to teach it now one such method of lesson planning which is which is very popular across the globe is backward design and i'm sure many of our educators here most of them maybe are already following this maybe we are just putting a name to it now in this backward designing educators begin their plan from their from their objective that okay this is the unit objective and what a student is expected to know by the by the end of the course by the end of the session and work backwards from there for instance like uh, designing lessons uh, projects and assessments designed to lead students towards the final goal now backward design is what moves lesson planning uh, from a checklist to a strategic action plan now that 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 shift is very very important so as we would all agree that failure to plan is planning to fail right we would all agree so it's like uh, it's like taking a uh, taking a you know long cross country road trip where we plan to make several stops along the way or uh, to rest to refuel to visit particular tourist attractions uh, but do we actually just get into the car and start without planning a failure to plan your route means that we run the risk of missing out on some popular tourist attraction along the way because we haven't planned uh, we might drive past some stops because we actually don't know the route we will miss the opportunity to combine some important attractive you know tourist spots which are you know near to each other although we may end up taking a longer route because we have not consulted the map now whatever whatever our desired journey is a failure to plan ahead is is, is actually dooming yourself to figuring this thing out as we go along and that's why the details really fall through the cracks now if an educator finds you know himself wondering what do i teach this week and merely look for an item that he can you know tick off the checklist in the next session he might be suffering from a failure to plan similar to what we discussed just now failure to plan the trip 
Thus, uh, when you're discussing about backward designing, it's really intended to help educators to create lesson plans that focus on goal uh, on a bird's eye view instead of getting stuck in the process. While the exact application uh, might vary with each setting or educator, a basic roadmap definitely can be followed. And we would all agree to that. Uh, of course, for instance, uh, I think important to create an index of the learning objectives that students are expected to meet by the end of the session. Very, very important. A list of essential knowledge, skills, concepts that they need to support their understanding or, or the course content. Second, I think uh, design, a, design a summative assessment that students will complete at the end to prove their uh, competency in the learning objective. Now, when we discuss about assessment, uh, this could take the form of an uh, exam, a writing assignment, assignment, a project. Now the format will be determined by the, by the course material and the learning objectives. Also, I think it's very important to create a series of lessons, projects, discussions, activities, you know, to, to, to help students progressively build layers of understanding and context, bringing them closer to the, to the, to the session goals. Also, each lesson must have a specific objective. So that, so that students really see value in the lesson content, which is very important to ensure that they, they are actively involved, like co-creators of knowledge in the whole journey and not passive recipients. Now, it's important for educators to, to, to resist that temptation because when we, when we do this planning, how do we do this planning? Uh, should this be, at times it's easier to plan a speech and deliver it into a class of captive listeners. But studies have shown that, that students respond best to an interactive inquiry-based approach, which prompts students to examine their preconception and position students as the author of their own learning process. They feel much more in control. So presenting students with, an, with, with open-ended questions provide educators, uh, you know, it really is a way of encouraging their focused participation. A student's ability, a student's ability to, to evaluate information, clearly articulate their thoughts and debate effectively with others. I believe these are powerful tools which promote, first of all, uh, critical thinking and second, evaluate levels of understanding. The need is to create an environment that promotes higher order thinking, finding ways to let them reveal things and put that into, into a plan. Now, very often educators might want them to, uh, want their students to interpret a map, analyze a document and so on, and ensure that they're always building their skills, providing students uh, with a forum for reflection at the end of each lesson, where they can summarize what they've learned and help each other to close any, any gaps in knowledge. Because peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, we all understand is so important. So students can really help each other to close in the gaps through interaction, through, through, through discussions that the educator may moderate. Above all, making lessons uh, relevant and relatable. Now, students are not motivated to learn something because merely because it's in the syllabus or it's important for exam. Yes, it is important. But I think it is more important to place things in context to help students understand uh, the role this knowledge or skill can actually play in their own lives, how to relate it. Add context to lessons by looking for ways to incorporate students' interests or culture. Now, why is culture so important? Because we discussed about relevance and we also discussed about the fact that we need to make the content relatable. So can a student actually relate to the content the kind of examples that are being given. Can a student actually connect with it? If students can draw some personal link with the subject, naturally they tend to retain far more knowledge because then it's not about memorizing it. They actually relate to it. Also, again, coming back to assessments, designing a series of formative assessments to serve as checkpoints to determine students' depth of understanding along the way. However, we discussed about lesson plannings, but it's really important also to appreciate because if I look at things uh, and I take a more holistic view, 
it is also very important and we need to understand that any lesson planning cannot be cast in stone esteemed educators really need flexibility to teach things the way they deem fit based on based on the receptivity and uh, we were discussing about making education more relatable also considering the fact that each student has separate learning needs so at times uh, giving that kind of flexibility uh, or the kind of impromptu approach is also equally important so that's uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of criticism around this that can a one shoe fits all approach to instruction uh, is it actually stifling our classrooms because the current trend because when we discuss about lesson planning you know at times there's a tendency to overdo it now uh, and again the this standardized learning scripted curriculum and Uh, if if a teacher is actually being given a script to go and deliver they actually shackles educators across the country and and it will end up discouraging talented talented individuals joining teaching as a profession because in an effort to minimize gaps in teacher quality which we all understand may exist just like any other profession right so whether you look at uh, law as a profession whether you look at medicine as a profession well naturally two professionals may have varying degrees of quality and that's perfectly human that's normal but in an effort to minimize gap in terms of teacher quality at times there there have been some educational reformers around the world and i've and i've looked at some some research papers as well who have pushed for a more a uh, more routinized one shoe you know one size fits all approach to instruction and classroom culture now while this 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 kind of course of action may be preferable to uh, preferable to those who are teachers by chance but we also need to appreciate the fact that there are a lot of very talented dedicated committed educators who are teachers by choice now it's a disaster in the making for students and for teaching profession also because again we need to appreciate the fact that if you look at things from students perspective it means the loss of a creative flexible and the loss of differentiation instruction tailored to each student because teaching again is a highly specialized job so instruction tailored to each student's uh, social emotional and academic needs is important for the profession and if we end up alienating talented teachers because we shackle them and if we if we ask them to ignore their instincts and and you know uh, and if they're faced with a situation where things are increasingly systemized systemized deadening job many of the most effective educators will desert the field for more rewarding opportunities now academically this allure of standardization is is especially seductive if teachers from the same grade uh, deliver the exact same lesson at the exact same time and and, and again why i am discussing this is because a uh, lot of literature i was going through what is happening in in, in us what is happening in europe and there has been a lot of literature in in this particular regard so at times it's easy to control quality you know quality control seems a little less daunting however moreover if you, if you look at a teacher's flexible child centered approach it really allows all of her students to feel important children know that their teacher is paying attention to them individual attention and the teacher is aware about their individual strength and the needs that matter to her so rather than feeling like you know cogs in the classroom machine a machine that will chug along in a, in a, in a predictable steady rhythm regardless of who sits at which desk this first reader know that their presence shifts the tone of the classroom and affects how the entire year unfolds so the the feeling of being a change maker now whether it be, it, it be from an educator's perspective or from a student's perspective the feeling of being a change maker in a classroom you know really ensures especially for children to feel invested in and excited by excited uh, with regard to their lives at school so you know and also if we don't trust teachers uh, if if we really don't trust teachers i don't think that's the right way to go the concept of teaching is something that we believe we cannot reduce to scripts and playbooks because the reality is that teaching is a is a very difficult profession and that requires immense preparation and that realization is now setting in 
we we are we are in this particular forum we have discussed time and again about countries like finland which are doing so so well in the field of education and how the best of the lot goes for teaching as a profession because that is where that is where we are taking care of our strategic needs for the future and not merely about our operating needs for for, for the present times now now in teaching we all bring ourselves to this uh, wonderfully human and complex job leaning into our individuality which allows us to follow our instinct which in turn enables us to connect authentically with students and tailor learning to their needs uh, i was going to a writing of uh, israeli born teacher and psychologist him ginot who famously wrote and this is i am sure many of our educators will be aware of this he famously wrote i have come to the terrifying realization that i am the decisive element in my classroom it's a daunting but empowering notion our choice in the classroom matter indeed that do matter right we, we all we all understand and we all agree so rather than teacher proofing these choices go through standardized curricula and language it's important to properly train and trust teachers to think to to, to think on their feet and seize up on opportunities to help students feel understood valued and challenged these three are very very essential elements i believe now of course new teachers will need to be coached and supported but it's not about giving scripts that's an extreme form they'll be you know they'll be able to jump right into the complicated work of helping children become engaged individuals who believe that they can make a difference in their classroom and beyond so this was an extreme case that i discussed of course lesson planning is very very important there's no two doubts about it but what we are discussing now is not about lesson planning that was about scripting which i believe is not the right way to go indeed there needs to be a plan of course there needs to be a long term plan and that also needs to be broken into short term plans lesson plans but of course individual educators need to be given the flexibility to to conduct classes in their own way as well which is so important for development of children so i think birds are very nicely summed up uh, the steps as far as lesson planning goes whether that be identifying learning objectives uh, plan specific learning objectives assess students understanding accordingly uh, plan sequence of lessons in in engaging and meaningful manner create a realistic timeline and last plan for lesson closure how to close a particular lesson now to be effective lesson plan i believe does not have to be a, a very exhaustive document that prescribes each and every possible classroom scenario it should provide you with a with a with a general outline of teaching goals learning objectives and means to accomplish them it is a reminder of what you want to do and how you want to do it because i believe a productive lesson is not one in which uh, everything goes exactly as planned but one in which both students and instructors learn from each other so that a good lesson plan is a living document it is not cast in stone as i told you but rather it is a guide that 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 keeps you that keeps the educator the classroom practitioner engaged and thinking about what he or she is teaching as the future of the world is in the classroom today i thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing indeed discussing about lesson planning after uh, barat sir with 45 years of teaching experience in doon school indeed was a very challenging task but uh, that was just my humble effort i thank all of you again over to you shubhai thank you achin thank you for that wonderful presentation and touching up on so many aspects of lesson planning well we have a fantastic panel lined up for you that will discuss further on this topic of lesson planning but this is where i get to tell you a little bit about notebook we at notebook are an edtech organization we make small videos pertaining to the school curriculum these videos are used in two places one when you are taking your classes you can play these notebook videos as part of a method to give your students a more visual understanding of what you are going to teach particularly for the young learners it is very important that they have a very visual understanding a visual grasp of the topics that you are teaching these videos allow you to do that also months later when the students need to revise for their exams they have access to the same videos on their personal devices whatever they have at home a laptop a smartphone any device 
can connect to notebook and watch videos from it. I'm going to play a small clip of one of the notebook videos now before we move on with the session today. Hello, my dear children, and welcome to notebook. Come, let's match the animals with their footprints. Let's find out the footprint of the elephant. Yes, it's D. Next, we can see a tiger. Where are the tiger's footprints? Yes, it's C. Where are the deer's footprints? Yes, it's E. Next, we can see a dog. Where are the dog's footprints? Yes, it's B. Now let's find out the footprint of the duck. Yes, it's A. Well done, children. Come, let's trace some objects and also name the shapes after tracing. This is a pencil box. We will trace the pencil box by taking our pencil all around the pencil box. What shape did we get? Yes, it's a rectangle. It has two long sides, two short sides and four corners. We can also draw a car with squares, rectangles and circles. Look, one big rectangle and one small rectangle for the body of the car. Two squares for the window and two circles for the wheel. Hooray! Our car is ready. Let us now try to draw traffic signal with circles and rectangles. We need two rectangles and three circles to make a traffic signal. Isn't that easy? Little Dia loves drawing. Look, she has drawn a robo using different shapes. That's truly incredible. Don't you think so? Now, look at the picture and tell how many triangles are there. Yes, you are right. Three. How many squares are there? Yes, you are right. Two. How many rectangles are there in the body of the robo? Yes, you are right. Twelve. Well, that was just a short clip of one of the notebook videos. This is for a class two student. And you would find more than 10,000 videos like these covering the entire CBSC curriculum right from classes one through to class 12. If you visit our website, www.notebook.school. Also, we are extremely proud to announce that we are starting off with live sessions. During our interaction with the many students who are using Notebook today, a lot of them have expressed an interest in having live sessions where they can have doubts cleared and we can tell them how to get the best value out of using Notebook. So starting Tuesday 11th of June, which is next week, we are starting with live sessions. What I would request is if you feel that your students might benefit from it, you could please share this link that you can see on your screen or ask them to send an SMS live class hyphen and their class. So a class six student would say live class hyphen six to this number 877-763-2039. We consider all of you a part of the larger notebook community. And if you could help us in spreading the word and have your students benefit from it, it would be our privilege to have them on the platform. That said, it is now time for me to introduce the wonderful, wonderful panel that we have lined up for you today. We have with us Mrs. Rasna Bhattacharji, who has worked in schools affiliated to different boards that include IB, IGCSE, ICSE, CBSC, and APSSC in various cities of India. She has been in the field of school education for more than two decades and has worked in various capacities consisting of teaching at various levels through primary to senior secondary as a vice principal and principal. As a principal, she's had extensive hands-on experience in all spheres of school, academics and administration, development and management of school systems with a special emphasis on curriculum development and training of staff. Her experiences have been shaped largely by her schooling in St. Mary's Convent Kanpur the Institute of Education, University of London, UK, and working with Kendriya Vidyalaya Pune 
and Aga Khan Education Services India. She has a double master's in botany from Kanpur University and in education and international development from University of London, UK. Ma'am, it's a privilege to have you on the platform today. Thank you so much for making the time. We also have with us Dr. Krishna Kathuria, who has worked as a founder, principal, and a director of a school for 12 years. Her total work experience in the field of education spans 26 years. She served the single organization for 12 years as a principal and helped it to develop from scratch till its present reputation, including the affiliation process. She has worked as a vice principal supervisor for St. Mira's Primary School, Pune, worked as a founder and administrator come teacher for Shraddha Tutorials for 18 years, worked as a head for Montessori Teachers Training Institute for five years, worked as a principal for Walnut School in Pune, and worked as a principal for Mount Literacy School, Chandrapur, and is at present working as the principal for Edify School, Amravati. She's received numerous awards throughout her career. She's received the International School Award by British Council, Top Performing School Educator Award by CED Foundation, Progressive School Leader Award, Bharat Shiksharatna Award, Doctorate in Professional Endorsements, Outstanding Principal Performer by MDN Education, Lifetime Achievement Award by National School Award, Bhishma the Determination Award 2020, Top 30 Outstanding Achiever Principal Award by Wednesday Times, Principal of the Year 2021, British Council's International Dimension School ISA Award for the years 2020 to 2023. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here. It's a privilege to have you on the platform. I shall start my video now, stop the share so we can see each other. And let me also learn from you more about this topic, lesson planning. Good evening to everyone. Good evening, ma'am. Ma Pleasure to be with Notebook once again. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's our privilege. Ma'am, if I may come to you first, uh, how do you see lesson planning, your tips, and what is the importance of lesson planning in your school? Mm. Carrying forward from what Mr. Bhattacharya and what Mr. Bharat said, and then I was going through the message boxes box also. Lesson plan is important to have an effective classroom, but there have been times when I found that the plan says something and something else is happening in the classroom. So those are very tricky situations. For a new teacher, lesson plan is really, really helpful. I will take cues from what we do in our school and how we go about it, which would address a lot of points which I was reading in the message box. What Mr. Bhattacharji said about scripting, I wouldn't call, we call it scripting, but yes, maybe it is so. We, CBC has said that there is an annual pedagogical plan that we create. So we create a framework which we call as the annual pedagogical plan, which we are supposed to upload into the CBSE website, give, give a link, we are supposed to give there. So that's a framework which we create, which has got the minimum amount of stuff in it. So that if there is a, if there is a teacher leaving in the middle of the year, or if we have, I mean, these are realities now, we have to be prepared for it. Or if uh, there is a teacher who has to suddenly go on leave. So there is that framework present over there. But then at the same time, we look for what else can the teacher add to it to ensure that her own, those who are actually wanting to be teachers, their needs are satisfied. At the same time, the children are also benefiting maximum out of it. So both the things get addressed over here. One, we've got a framework. This is the minimum you have to do. Second is you want to show your skill as a teacher, your knowledge as a teacher, then work beyond this. It will always help you as a teacher and your children will be better learners. You will learn from your experience as well. Few days back only, I was talking to a pair of teachers. One of them is going to teach the class for the first time. And she got a partner who has been teaching in the school in the same class for the past two, three years. So the new one tells me, ma'am, what if I don't want to do everything the way she is doing? But she insists that the partner teacher does whatever she is doing. I said, see, you are working for an institution and for the children. So it is not compulsory that you have to do whatever she is doing. So you can feel the rivalry of the teachers also. There are people who want to do more. I don't know how to read into it, but I'm just giving my reading into it. 
she maybe she's feeling that i will be pulled down pulled back where will i show what i want to do so that's then i how i address the teachers that that's just the basic plan you go ahead and do what you want if somebody is stopping you then you say no this is how i want you want to do it you do your style i will do my style that is how your style will develop that is how i will know as uh, i read that point somewhere in the message box that if i have to decide who's a better teacher this is going to help me to decide who's a better teacher and then yeah that's how it takes it forward so those are just so the crux of the matter is that yes lesson planning is important definitely it has to be done and for a new teacher very very important thank you so much ma'am thank you for sharing those views uh, dr kathuriya if i may come to you next with the same question but uh, before you start ma'am of uh, a big thank you for encouraging all your teachers to be part of the together for education platform we've had an overwhelming number of teachers from the edify school amravati on the platform and we are so so glad to be of service over to you uh, first of all i would like to uh, extend my thanks to almighty god for this beautiful life then management of edify school amravati who has given me this wonderful opportunity to serve edify school amravati as a principal and then nevertheless notebook for providing this wonderful platform to uh, keep my views in front of you all uh, according to me yes lesson plan is very very important as a lot of other speakers have given in detail about how it should be and i really like the way achin sir has said the, about cognitive theory um he said something like there should be a balance between curricular and co curricular activities and yes the very important point what he said is there are a lot of things available on net a lot of theories are there they tell us what to do but no one tells us how to do so i i, I will just throw some light on how to do part of what mr achin was saying according to me lesson planning is definitely very important few of them say that lesson planning should be there for all the classes of course it should be there if the teacher is experienced enough so it does not need much more lesson planning for secondary and higher secondary and normally what the teachers do the mistake and what normally a society does this mistake from parents sides also from society side or from school educator side also this mistake is generally done they all think that it is very much necessary to plan for the lessons of secondary and higher secondary i would deny the fact i would rather say it is very very crucial and important to plan lesson planning to do the lesson planning for pre primary and primary classes because you know the age of the children in pre primary and primary classes is uh, they take the teacher as a god teacher is second god to them and teacher or classroom is the first thing when they come into the society and they try to imitate each and everything they try to learn and imbibe each and everything from teacher's perspective no uh, when they reach home then say mama aaj meri teacher ne itne bade stilos pehne the so this is just what they see and imagine and understand right and then uh, for them normally teachers think that uh, it's very easy to teach pre primary classes so it does not need much of the planning but i'll deny the fact even on the contrary these classes need more and more planning because these are the classes where you need to be more focused on learning objectives what are students going to get out of that learning objectives so for this particularly each and every school has their own style of lesson planning normally 90% of the schools follow bloom's taxonomy right so i would like to throw some light on bloom's taxonomy how it is and how it should be actually done 
and if time permits i would like to give one example live example to explain the things can i sure ma go for it um so see if we talk about bloom's taxonomy bloom's taxonomy it was actually it is based on three main domains uh, one is first one is cognitive which is something knowledge based domain it has six levels and then the affective domain which is attitudinal based domain there are five levels and psychomotor which has which is skill based domain okay if the teacher knows all these things in a proper way and if the teacher blends all these domains in her lesson planning for primary and pre primary of course for secondary as well then if the teacher plans it for primary level then i guess so we can create the beautiful citizens of tomorrow i would like to give one example uh, if we talk about cognitive domain so as i told you there are six levels so these are remembering understanding applying analyzing evaluating and creating okay uh, if we are going in any mediocre teachers class so how the lesson is going on whether the teacher has planned or not sometimes ma rachna ma'am has very beautifully said something shown on paper sometimes is completely different than seen in the class right so here i would throw some light if we need to balance the things so how it should be if you are entering in the mediocre teachers class who is just doing work for the sake of doing so how she will start the lesson uh, take the example of balance that which is for grade 4 or 5 of cbse or icse all the boards normally that plan we teach it to the students in grade 4 and 5 itself right so the mediocre teacher starts okay children today we are going to learn something about that okay there are these are the proteins that should have proteins vitamins minerals this 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 she just tells the hierarchy and then starts asking the questions okay so what have you understood what do you mean by proteins what do you mean by minerals no straight away no we should not encourage the teachers with such kind of planning according to my view the planning should be first level you need to reach is remembering okay if you are teaching if you are teaching the class about diet plan okay balanced diet so in remembering it should be related to their real life situations what they had yesterday in their dinner in their breakfast in their lunch and then bring them to the understanding level okay if you had this this means you had something if say for example if you had paratha or roti or chapati for your lunch this means you had carbohydrates parts more okay so in this way from remembering we go to the second level that is understanding okay then many of the teachers come to this part in a brilliant and beautiful way okay they get successful in remembering and then they get successful in understanding also many teachers fail in applying analyzing and creating which are most important domains of lesson planning okay so now how this apply should be once child has understood the elements of a balanced diet so by checking their knowledge just give them examples where they can apply their knowledge say for example if you have you are done with okay uh, the understanding of the children is brilliant 90% students have understood what are the contents of the balanced diet then come to the application part okay children 
Now, what are we going to do? You know, we are going to have a party tonight. So, can we quickly draw something? How your plate should look like? If the students are saying, "Ma'am, I'll have four gulab jamun first," you are fail as a teacher. If the student is saying, "I'll have four leg pieces chicken," again you have failed. But if ninety percent of your class is answering, "Ma'am, I'll start with salad. I'll take little bit of salad." Then, as you said, lentils are important part, and they play an important role in our life. So, I'll take little bit of curd or Uh, I'll take little bit of dal, and then uh, I'll take one chapati. I'll take little bit of vegetables, sweet but only one gulab jamun, and I decorate my plate in such a way which will look not only colorful but it will be healthy as well. So here is the output of applying. you have given a chance to the student to apply the knowledge what you have given them right then analyze it, here it is it has been analyzed with applying only you have analyzed ki how well they have understood the lesson and then comes the very important and crucial part that is creating what teachers think how can we create e each and every lesson plan see every time creating does not mean give them a project of uh, making a chart paper and something no nowadays we all know it very well our lesson should be blended learning kind it should be a mix of many subjects integrated learning so here in creating you can bring in that blend also by giving them a chance okay children now uh, as mr achin has said ki there is it is very difficult to balance co curricular and curricular activities so it is a part of extra curricular i must say not co curricular um annual days and all that these are extras right so the same thing we can bring it in our lesson planning and we can bring it to the curriculum so give them a chance okay children uh, i am giving two days time to all of you we are going to have our annual day and i want all of you to set the menu of that annual day and at the same time teacher must give them a chance The teacher must give them the estimate. One pe one kg rice, this many people can eat. So what is our budget? How many people are going to eat? How many people are going to attend? And then if we are going to sell it out, then what is profit? What is loss? What is estimation? Mathematics part comes. and by teaching this you can teach them a lot of values also like uh, visitors are our guest so how should we should we treat our guest how should we treat our elders so overall in one lesson how many domains i have covered i have covered all the six cognitive domains i have covered affective domain that is values sensibility it comes as affective domain right and then i have touched upon psychomotor also because in psychomotor children try to initiate they take precisions they take decisions so overall in one lesson plan i have covered all the domains so planning should be in such a way 
it should be recorded documented in a proper way so that if say for example that teacher see we all are human beings i may not feel good tomorrow but if it is a planned lesson so some other person can also take it in the similar way as i have planned so according to me lesson planning is very very important not only from one perspective from overall learning objective to gain the learning objective it is very important wonderful ma'am i think that example really really helped because there were a lot of questions on the q and a boxing how do you do this how do you do that thank you so much for that uh, and ma'am honestly when i was in school if somebody would have asked me to set the menu for the annual day me being from calcutta everybody would have had four rasgullas i'll just admit to it right away uh rasab i'm fine may come to you next uh you know i love playing the devil's advocate we are talking about teaching uh, students for a vuka world right ambiguity flexibility and here we are talking about how the classroom is structured right how do you balance the two they they look very contradictory to me i i have two things to tell over here a little bit to carry forward to what uh, dr krishna has been explaining so nicely uh i call it as elements of lesson design so on one hand you have the bloom's taxonomy where you design your lesson plan about to add to that there are a few more things that a teacher necessarily must keep in mind and put it into the plan i call it as principles of learning simple to complex concrete to abstract here now to dare then very important for primary classes especially where the children are growing phase even in 9th and 10th there are certain concepts which are very abstract very difficult for children to visualize so we have to first help them to visualize it and then explain the concept per se two more things in addition to that one is howard gardner's multiple theory intelligence intelligence theory which is in relation to styles of learning now that cartoon is very famous if you remember where you have got all those small small animals and then the fish is asked to fly so what are we doing for all those different children in our classes who have got different styles of learning we are caught in that web indians i mean as a nation that we think teaching too much is wonderful and the vuka and content based learning are at logger heads that's my view on one hand we are saying let children grow the the way they want to on the other hand we are stuffing content both things can't happen but then yeah we have learned to manage our way around we've learned as principals and as teachers to find a midway over there so we try to look for activities uh, a combination of activities which will address all of these things very tricky for a teacher i have done it myself and i still do it with my own set of teachers whether it is my own school or the group of schools that we work with together and actually we spend a lot of time in planning now going back to vuka i used to teach 11th and 12th i began my career teaching 11th and 12th now in the ncert books it was written that there is a certain section from which only the questions will be asked there is content given in boxes nothing will be asked from that great it was my first year of teaching 11th and 12th i told children children told me those are grown up children 11th 12th are grown up boys and girls and i was a young teacher at that time so we were more on friendly terms at that stage and the first year my result was miserable those children came back and told me ma'am we said like this we did like this but there was a question from there next year i changed my strategy i told the children this book is your framework every sentence in this book you must know by heart <laughs> from that year my results were a drastic change so today vuka applies the context has changed a little bit the world has i feel the world has become a little more complex children have become more smart vuka really applies in the higher classes even today now i tell the 9 10 11 12 children to be prepared for the unexpected every year i have one or two children coming and tell me this was not taught in the class everything is taught in the class 
everything is discussed in the class. It is only that we fail to understand that this might be asked in another form. So that another form children are not able to fathom because the thinking pattern has not been set up like that. So it's all about training the mind to think like that. That training has to start from a very early age. We cannot do it suddenly in ninth and 10th. Uh, when I started my career as a principal, we do something, all of us do, all principals do, all teachers do. We've got these unknown passages that are given across the school, all classes, including class one. So then there was a parent who came and said, how can you give something that you have not taught? So this should have been revised before. Now we had to explain to the parent that how it is not something which is not taught and how it is going to develop the skills which are required. Though it is not taught per se, but it is something which is age relevant, all the vocabulary in that is known to the child. So we have to see that if I have done A, something which is connected to it and is B, may not be familiar to the children, but they should be able to understand it. And that is where your buka comes. I think I have uh, explained it in a nutshell. Wonderful, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for the examples. Uh, Dr. Kasuri, if I may come to you, do you feel that there's a place for flexibility in the lesson plan? Can you build a lesson plan to be flexible? Yes, of course. It should be flexible. Flexible, uh, not in terms of uh, learning objectives. Learning objectives are the clear and set goals. Flexible, it should be flexible in terms of time. If a lesson is well prepared, so definitely teacher knows about the flexibility and she keeps some pace of flexibility in that lesson plan itself. Wonderful, ma'am, because my, my understanding of this is because the, the syllabus does not change that frequently. And over a period of time, perhaps Let lesson plans... Let me add over here, uh, Mr. Roy, Shubhayu, that syllabus or the content is a means. It, you use it as a, as a tool for teaching, but it is not the thing that has to be done. Because there's something called as tangible and intangibles everywhere. So here... Yes. Your tangible part that, okay, I have to complete 10 lessons in this subject in this year. But it is not just that. There are other things that have to be taught or the children have to learn along with it. It comes along with it. There is that saying, children learn in spite of teaching. So the best teacher can become the worst teacher if she or he is not careful about this thing. Uh, going back to my own memories, the first year when I taught 12, I did not know uh, how to space out the lessons. I just went by the lessons as they were given in the textbook in that order. And I found towards the end, I was teaching all the difficult lessons and at a fast pace. So the understanding of the children was poor and I could see that I was not teaching properly and the children were not receiving. That year was a real, and I have taught before that 9th, 10th and other classes. But for teaching 11th and 12th, that was my first year. And I, I was really upset with myself. And I always narrate the story to all the teachers in every forum, that how I learned from my own mistakes. The next year, I made a 360 degree change in the way I took up the syllabus. That year was really peaceful for me. So I always tell the teachers, and I always discuss in a forum, that teacher is the best person to decide in the class. But then again, I have seen teachers who come by choice take good decisions. Some teachers I have seen over a period of two or three years, they learn to take decisions. Some teachers, they just decide and go with the flow. Okay, madam said this, so they are working for madam. Madam said this, they will do this. Madam said don't do this, they will not do this. That becomes, that kind of a situation becomes very risky for us. So then you have a class where you've got 30 different kinds of children. So you've got a class, I tell the teachers in my school, we've got 30 different kinds of teachers. We have to teach the 30 different kinds of teachers in 30 different kinds of ways. 
So that again comes to that multiple style of learning. And we spend time differently. Get the teachers, do that brainstorming session with them on a one-to-one -one basis and bring about this point again that this also has to be done, that also has to be done. Find a midway. We have to measure the tangibles also. We have to measure the intangibles also. So when we are talking about VUCA, when we are talking about developing it as a life skill, it becomes important, especially today when the competition is so high. Children have to be taught to deal with adversity. We were talking, yesterday I was in one session talking about uh, advers skill, adversity skill, the lady said. So I learned, okay, there is something called as adversity skill also. So how balanced you are in a situation which is challenging is something when you get children to understand if you are throwing in that element of unexpected all the time, they will get prepared automatically that, yeah, this might come, I cannot complain. I better be prepared for it. That's how it goes. Wonderful. In short, in okay. short I'll sum up. Uh, Rasna Ma'am is trying to say that there should, flexibility should be given to the teachers. But we also have to make sure that they are taking on the flexibility in a constructive way. Not yes, everybody exactly. is able to utilize that flexibility properly. Exactly. So that monitoring exactly. from the from monitoring is important. No, no compromise with learning objectives and goals of learning. Right. Rest everything can be managed. Wonderful, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Katuria, my last question to you would be. Uh, now that you're planning for online lessons, right? We've had a year of uh, first being hit with the shock of on online learning, then getting used to online learning. And we have reached a point where people are actually innovating around online learning. So uh, how are you planning for your online lessons for this uh, academic session? See, if planning, if you, you talk about planning, there is not much difference between planning for online teaching or in-person teaching, or you can say offline teaching. Yes, definitely. Now we are heading towards hybrid teaching, which needs a lot of planning. Because hybrid is many a times teachers, if you talk about, if you ask a teacher about what is hybrid learning, so they, they mix it with blended learning. Let me be very clear. Blended learning is something different than hybrid learning. Blended learning is where you need to uh, blend a lot of subject matters, concepts to be brought together so that with the help of one concept, you are teaching a lot of concepts together. Wherein hybrid learning is you are taking online classes, you are teaching the students in online mode and at the same time, few students are sitting in front of you and you are catering to with them also. So this is called hybrid learning. What normally government is suggesting for this year is we should go for hybrid kind of learning wherein we are calling half of the class, in, uh, half of the uh, students in the school and half of learning at home. So it, it will be a hybrid learning and definitely hybrid learning will need a proper planning from teachers and school side. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Rashta, ma'am, the same question to you. How are your online plans different from your offline plans? Uh, for me, they are quite different. Now, carrying forward from what Dr. Krishna said, the two terms, blended learning and hybrid learning, are often used interchangeably. And personally speaking, I'm okay with it, as long as the meaning is conveyed and understood clearly. Now, when we are talking about blended learning, what Dr. Krishna said is definitely true. But the other part of it is when you are mixing and matching different modes of learning, that is also blended learning. As far as hybrid teaching goes, this has been a, I have done so much of reading in the past one year that then, then I decided that I will create my own understanding. Hybrid learning, 
you have half the class attending from home and half the class in school the teacher is teaching both of them simultaneously hybrid learning can also be that you are teaching half the class in school today and half the class which is online is being taught by somebody else so there are two parallel systems going on both of which are possible one needs a timetable structuring in that way basically it matters about how you are structuring the timetable now coming to how is online teaching different from uh, in person or physical classes there is difference in the sense that in the classroom the kind of tools that you are using while we were doing physical classroom we had the overhead projector we had uh, the digital solutions the videos so teachers would either do it in the class that was assigned to them and there were schools as is a medium kind of school so we had audio visual rooms now there are schools where there are overhead projectors in every room so use it you use it along with your teaching simultaneously now when the whole thing shifted to online teachers started using the digital media as a, as a teaching aid now using a teaching aid means the teacher is using it to teach the children and then i started getting complaints from children from teachers children are leaving the classrooms they are empowered now you got a click of a button and you are out of the class who can stop them so i said now it is your responsibility that how are you going to keep them into the class it is no longer in the physical classroom that you say no you can't go out and they can't go out now they have the freedom to go out so your classroom has to get structured which will keep them in the classroom now comes the use of digital tools where the children are involved simultaneously so that i can track the children on my screen what are they doing along with me the moment the children know yes the teacher is watching me while i am on screen the whole perspective of the child also changes and i have actually seen it we did a we did an action research three four teachers they did an action research in the school and we found it really worked so where ppts and movies the short movie clippings they were the tools that the teachers were using only to teach the children were involved but they were involved one at a time so 30 children were not involved simultaneously when you involve all those 30 or 25 children simultaneously that is what makes a difference so now you have to have tools not only that are used as a teaching tool by the teacher but also to be used by the children to learn simultaneously that is what makes a difference so our lesson planning this year has become different we have the online tool till last year they would write they were using a ppt or they were using a movie clipping or they were using some kind of a drawing or something which the teacher was using only for teaching now there is another column to it where they have to add that what is it you are going to use to involve the children at least for 5 minutes in the classroom so that children have that element of curiosity before entering the class okay what is the teacher going to do today with us so that point becomes critical now to keep children into the class and i said keep it hanging in the class that hook thing that uh, mr bhattacharya said no so that is the hook for the class to keep the children in the class which has become very important now so that's how we are working and i see that yes it has changed the attendance in the classroom there are more children not all still but yes more children are staying in the classroom now especially in the higher classes it really makes a lot of difference wonderful ma'am and almost i would like to add something over here almost 90% of my teachers are using different tools so that check whether children are understanding they are what they are learning we are using a lot of padlets then uh, other such kind of tools so that it becomes very this thing and for every time each and every lesson we are planning so there so that there should be some kind of activity is where the children are involved and then we give give them something to be uh, submitted by the students and sometimes we give them very quick notes to submit 
so that they are not getting any chance to do some kind of mal practices so we are blending in this way my teachers are perfectly doing all these things nowadays and for next year also definitely our plans are completely on roll so we are going to utilize all the possible resources as we are also a kind of middle uh, this thing school but yes my teachers are doing wonderful job by blending all the technological tools and with their teaching and everything thank you so much ma'am uh, i can just hope that notebook features in both your online lesson plans this year yes. uh, well this has been a fantastic discussion thank you so much thank you so much for this wonderful wonderful views uh, ochin you will have quite a bit to thank for today i was already breaking out in sweat thinking that i'll have to talk about lesson planning with two people who between them have more than 50 years of teaching experience i think i did okay ochin over to you for the thanks i think uh, a really really wonderful session with such a esteemed and experienced panel um, i must thank uh, our esteemed panelists but sir uh, thank you as always for giving us a great start and also for ensuring that uh, you know you really highlighted some very very important uh, issues which are also later on discussed by our other esteemed panelists as well but thank you sir thank you so much for setting the tone uh, dr krishna i sincerely thank you ma'am i think uh, one thing that i completely agree with you the way uh, when you started uh, you know that the importance of lesson planning especially in pre primary and primary you know it it is really very very important no doubt about it uh because those are those are as as you rightly mentioned a child's first interaction you know in terms of going out in terms of uh, in the first time out of the house being a part of the society and also ma'am uh, i think you you very well uh, summed up and and the example of bloom's taxonomy i think very very appropriate you know each stage you know each stage that that you uh, described and uh, discussed and described starting from uh, remembering to understanding uh Uh, then again uh, going forward to applying to analyzing evaluating and of course creating you know the the ultimate objective which is uh, so so important uh and also i think uh, another thing that uh, uh, you mentioned uh, krishna ma'am which uh, really sums it up you know because when i i was uh, deliberating on this issue i had spoken about uh, the need to strike a balance you know it while in one hand it's important to have a lesson plan we all would agree on the other hand of course educators also need some degree of flexibility i think you you very well summed it up when you said that uh, flexibility is important uh, but of course monitoring is equally important and no compromise in terms of learning objective i think learning objective i i completely agree uh, in fact rachna ma'am you also mentioned this in terms of uh, you know in terms of the fact that yes uh, it is important to give flexibility but not in terms of learning objective and monitoring as you, as you mentioned uh rashna ma'am uh, thank you so much i think uh, uh, i remember last time also when you were there in our webinar uh, we did benefit from your words of wisdom some very important points you had highlighted this time as well i uh, it's really is really our privilege to learn from esteemed educators like you and i'm sure all members in our audience as well they stand benefited you know with this session today as i was speaking just now i received a text message uh, from my team stating that already more than 475 people have attended this session of course at times people log in and then in between they log out as well Uh, we saw around parallel i think roughly around 400 attendees but total 475 so the kind of impact and 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 it all and i'm so happy to see that the kind of experience the insight that you share it benefits so many teachers you know that is the objective benefits educators and at the end of the day students are being benefited so rashna ma'am i think uh, uh, one very important aspect you touched upon was the need to visualize i think uh, we couldn't agree more it is really very very important the need to visualize completely agree with you on that and also uh, i really like the way you shared your own experience especially in terms of your first year of teaching and as as a as, as a case study as an example for so many educators here and i must appreciate it takes a lot of honesty courage humility uh, to 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 give this example and come up with this you know really hats off to you i we you know we, we all would agree, agree to this that you know wonderful ma'am thank you thank you so much for this also i was going through uh, while you were speaking uh, you know some great reviews from our viewers as well uh, many of them have complimented you ma'am as well as they have com complimented uh, dr krishna as well with regard to your deliberations that yes they do stand benefited 
and I saw Barrett's also answering some live questions, etc. I think, uh, thank you. and also that's I think, nice to hear. thank you, ma'am. Thank you, know, that you. That's is nice object. to hear. That is objective, ma'am. And also, uh, you know, I think one last point that you mentioned that how to deal with adversity, that which is also so, so important in today's world when we are teaching our children for jobs that do not even exist, you know, two decades from now, one decade from now, we don't even know, right? So I think we, we really had a great session. I thank uh, all of you. I also thank members of the audience for, for their support as always. Notebook is your platform. And I always uh, encourage and appreciate your feedback and suggestion also with regard to future topics. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, take care, and, and goodbye. Thank you. We also friend. benefit well, from the session. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, you. you ma'am. Thank you. Our privilege. Thank you.